All right, let's get started. So we're starting a new uh, unit, unit C, which is where we're going to focus on these system archetypes in a little bit more detail that we've kind of talked about a little bit so far with like the escalation and the accidental adversaries. Um, so this is on our path to building more complex causal loop diagrams, have a lot more uh, loops in them. And then unit D will be where you actually start building the simulation models in the stock and flow diagrams. So sort of to go and motivate that. So this is an example that I borrowed from uh, Met uh, Office, which is kind of like the UK's version of the Weather Channel, where they're trying to uh, communicate that in when talking about global warmings, there are different types of feedbacks. There are positive feedbacks that are a little bit more uh, uh, popularized, and then there are negative feedbacks. And um, and so they're trying to communicate here that there are um, faster loops that are more uh, salient to us because they. They're, they're more obvious and there are slower loops that are less obvious, but if we were to consider the whole system, we have to consider both of them together. And then you can see that they're kind of going for a causal loop diagram here. But um, if you look at this causal loop diagram that they've built, um, it, it doesn't quite fit our rules. And so what are some of the things that are not ideal about this, uh, you know, this attempt at a causal loop diagram? Is that a hint? Speeds up warming. So the question, so the what was pointed out here is the words aren't necessarily you know following the pattern we're looking at. And I think the example user speeds up warming. Um, is it um, it's got kind of a direction to it, it's got an up there as well. Um, I'd also maybe point out that um, you know it sounds kind of verb-like, you know, speeds up warming. Um, any other you know issues? Um, yeah. Um, there's no polarity on the arrows. Right, there's no polarity as well. So we don't they tell us this is a positive feedback, but we don't know um, exactly what are the mechanisms that uh, underlie that positive feedback. Um, any other specific, I mean, we've already kind of mentioned a couple, but you, even like specific examples of things we've already mentioned, other things that other complaints we have about their choices here. Yeah. Color scheming. Oh yeah, so the colors, yeah, right. So if we went to um, Sturman's uh, definition of a causal loop diagram, this is way too busy. It should just be words and, and arrows. Um, so what do the colors mean? They look like it has something to do with speed. They're trying to sort of say that in this heat map, the redder is faster, but does that mean that the orange is less fast than the red? Like there's a lot of like semantics here that seem to be hidden or meaningless. So yeah, we'd like to get rid of those. So, um, so we like to maybe improve this. And I think like this idea that like the words like creates change, that's kind of a verb thing. So again, it almost seems like they're telling us a story in time, like speeds up warming, and then I guess global warming creates change, which also then speeds up warming. It's like it's more about a sequence than about causal hypotheses here. And so um, we might just drop the verbs and try that. But if we do that, if we just look at like creates change, you were to just go up here and drop, um, there's my mouth over there, there it is. If you were to just go over here and the creates change and just take out the creates, then it wouldn't be specific enough. It would just be like change. So you get like change, warming, warming, change. So it seems like we need more specifics. So that's really when we're looking at these things, building our own CLDs, we want it to be specific enough for the mechanisms to be clear and still communicate the loops and things. So let's try to do that. So, um, so what might we put here? So let's um, let's say if we were to look at this positive feedback loop, this is kind of the, the loop that does the most kind of damage. We've already given an example of a positive feedback with global warming before. I don't know if anybody can remember that example, but we could do another one here too. But can we think of a positive feedback that's involved in global warming? Or, uh, well, yeah, I, mean, I guess could you, even something that participates in it. And if you just have an idea for one, then we can maybe fill in the others, yeah. Ice melting. And so if I wanted to do ice melting, um, that's like this general process. Like I could imagine writing like ice melting or something as an annotation in the middle here. So what variables might I need to represent ice melting? Yeah. 
um, heat. So that might be something that uh, what we can say that, um, let's just say that heat, I think heat is definitely something, but we could say that global warming, we talk about temperature, that's kind of already, you know, tie it up here. So if we consider this is where we're accounting for heat, then what might we put in some of these things through the ice melting? Yeah. Um, CO2 is key. Um, so CO2, um, CO2 is a, a good one, uh, but if we want to, so there could be other loops here. So you could imagine like global warming, we'd have to figure out how does global warming increase CO2? And then CO2 definitely would feed back on global warming. But if we wanted to, and I think, so I think that's great. So we could, there could be a second loop that involves you know, CO2, but if we're just focusing on the ice melting process, what might we put here? Yeah, in the back? Yeah. Albedo, that sounds like a good one. So um, I could probably put that in either one of these boxes, but I have a feeling that albedo, which remember that's the reflectiveness of the ice, I probably want to put like down here. So if anybody online would like to, I'm also watching the chat. So I'm going to go ahead and um, let me see if I can add text. No, I'm going to have to write it. Okay. So I'm going to put albedo down here. A L B E D O. And so remember that's the reflectiveness um, of the um, of of the ice, really, um, sort of of the earth. And so before we get to sort of one here, if we know that albedo is in this box here, um, we'd like to maybe let's just go and label the thing that's coming out of it. So if albedo was to increase, how would that affect global warming? Would it, yeah, go ahead. It would go down. So we're gonna put a minus sign right here instead of this question mark. So we've took care of this question mark. So we've got an albedo and a minus sign. Anybody have questions about that minus sign? So as the reflectiveness of the earth increases, the opposite thing happens to global warming. That's why it's a minus. We could also put an O there. It's totally reasonable to put an O instead of a minus. O for opposite. Either, both of those are used widely when people draw these things. All right, any questions about that? The albedo. Okay, so now we've, we wanna to try to represent the ice melting here in this loop. We got albedo down here. So, we, we, now we think, well, what might we put up here? So albedo is the reflectiveness of the ice. So what might we put actually here? So as uh, this, basically we would want something to fill in the blank here. It's kind of like Mad Libs. As global warming increases or as global temperature were to increase. So we could say that warming is this whole process, but maybe going back to the comment earlier about heat, maybe this warming should actually be temperature. So I can do temp here. And so I can say as global temperature increases, it affects something up here that will then affect the albedo. So what might be that something up there? Anybody online or in person? We're looking for something for this upper corner here. And remember the whole process about the ice melt. Yeah. Ice, that sounds good to me. So I'm gonna put ice up here. And so ice as in the solid state of water. So um, how much, we could be more specific. We could say, you know, ice in a particular region, we could talk about ice on the surface or what, you know, but so it kind of depends on our stakeholder, how specific we want to get. I think ice is probably good enough for whoever I think is the stakeholder for, you know, reading this diagram. So now we got these two late arrows that we have to label here. Um, so as temperature, increases then what happens to ice does it decrease or increase i see how many people say it decreases how many people says it increases all right i think i saw and um and again online if you guys are happy to put in the chat your votes as well then i'll add merge those in then i think i saw more people say as temperature increases ice decreases and so that would be if we say that's what we're expecting, then what type of link would this be here? So 
How many people would put this as a negative on this question mark? How many people would make it as a positive? So it's kind of a split. So remember that the negatives represent opposite relationships. The positives represent same relationships. So we have to ask ourselves, if you put a change in here, do you get the same direction change or the opposite direction change there? An increase in temperature causes a decrease in ice. So that's an opposite relationship. So that's why I would put a negative or an O there, either one of those. And I got a couple of negatives online too. So put a minus or an O. Question. Yep. So like how you went from albedo Well, I, I mean, whenever I'm drawing these lines, I always, right, I always start the story from the thing on this, this side here. So I'm saying as temperature goes up, I get more melting, so I get less ice. So increase here, decrease there, opposite relationship. All right, questions on that, does that make sense? And then we just have to fill out this link here and confirm that we have this feedback here. So, um, so if I were in a hypothetical world where I got more ice, then I have to ask would I get more albedo or less albedo? So how many people would vote that I would get with more ice, I get more albedo? How many people would vote for that? Okay, I'm looking on line two. How about the other way around? With more ice, I get less albedo, less reflectance. Nobody with that. Okay, so because there's the same relationship, more goes to more, then I got a plus or an S. So I can label that with a plus. And so now we see where the scientists at Met Office got the, you know, why they labeled this a positive feedback. Because now I see that there's a one, there is a loop here. It's got an even number of negatives. Because an even number of negatives, one, two, then the loop is positive. So we get that positive feedback loop. So just to emphasize that, I might draw a little arrow around here. And I have a positive feedback loop, otherwise called a reinforcing. So I could do a plus or an R. All right, so now we, we'll have to do the more complicated one here, a little harder one, because it's, it's not one we think about as much. But are there um, questions about this loop over here, this positive feedback loop? Pretty clear? So at the end of lecture today, we'll be starting on the assignment. And I tried to provide, so my first time doing it is a hybrid activity, but there'll be an activity we traditionally do, spend a lot of time in class doing. And, and you'll have to come up with your own loops that you sort of, sort of like come up with a system that has this feature and that feature will, will come out of these archetypes. And, um, and so this is what we're kind of practicing here is that, you know, come up with a negative feedback loop related to global warming. We could have had a loop involving CO2. And like with that, for example, I could say something like uh, with more CO2, I get more temperature rise with more temperature rise. I might get more melting of permafrost. With more melting of permafrost, I get more release of CO2 or something like that. And then that would be an, a positive feedback involving um, you know, release of CO2. This particular positive feedback doesn't involve the release of CO2, but it does show that if you release enough CO2 to get temperature going, then eventually you can start this engine where the temperature will end up causing itself to increase even without further additions of CO2. All right, now, the one people don't think about as much is that there are negative feedbacks. So things that constrain the growth of, of temperature. And it's important to include those in our models, primarily because um, you find a lot of people would say, well, maybe global warming is not a problem. Maybe the planet will take care of itself. And then we have to say, well, what they're trying to communicate with faster and slower here is most of the negative feedbacks we come up with are so much slower than the positive feedbacks that the, by the time global warming takes care of itself, it will be so long that, um, that you know, we won't be here. You know, so it, 
the planet will take care of itself, but the planet won't take care of the humans, for example. So, um, so this, this is their way of not doing the simulation, summarizing the results of the simulation, saying that once we put this feedback in, we'll find it so slow that when we actually simulate the thing, by the time the global warming rounds itself off, this action will be so slow that it'll be so far in the future that we'll have major changes to society before uh, it takes care of itself. So let's try to figure out what one of these, these ones are. This is a little harder. Um, does anybody have a guess at what some of the, what a potential negative feedback would be? Yeah. That's an interesting one. We probably could, we could say, um, we could think about, that's not the one I had in mind, but I, we can talk this one out. So if you get an increase in temperature, maybe you have a decrease in population. From population, you might have, say, CO2 use or something. So if you had an increase in population, you'd have increase in temperature, an increase in CO2, and then increase in CO2, increase in temperature. So you could imagine one negative link here from temperature to population, two positive links here from population going back around here, and then that would be a negative feedback. And so that's kind of, you know, a very dark, you know, uh, dystopian sort of uh, you know, uh, negative feedback here, but it's, it's a good one. It's one we could put in there that we could plausibly justify that there is a link here from temperature to population. And as temperature gets too high there, we, it would be easy for us to justify that eventually you're gonna reach a point where increases in temperature will decrease population. And that will end up um, producing a limit on anthropogenic uh, temperature increases. Now, are there less, um, are there other negative feedbacks we can think about that maybe do not involve humans, that involve natural processes? Yeah. Um, plant respiration. Uh, online, they got, could it be trees and carbon dioxide? So those are, I think, the same uh, suggestions there. That would be an interesting one we could put in here as well. Maybe um, with an increase in temperature, we could get a plant physiologist or somebody in about knows about, you know, autotrophs and things. And there might be um, something that as, you get higher temperatures, you end up getting maybe more effective, um, uh, 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 more effective scrubbing of CO2 out of the atmosphere as plants grow more. And with the increase in plant growth, you get even more effective or something like that. And ultimately you end up getting a negative feedback where the, um, where the, the increase in temperature will ultimately lead to a slow process of scrubbing the air of CO2, which will end up decreasing temperature in the long run. So maybe plants are involved in here too. I think we could probably come up with a cycle from that. The one that I had in mind um, was a, a very slow process, which is why I'm kind of throwing this up here, which is um, uh, the chemical um, sort, of, sort of sequestration of carbon in little critters out in the ocean. And so um, you could put chemical, in fact, I'm just gonna go to the next slide so I don't have to write it out and then we can just annotate. So like on the next slide, on this side here, we can put chemical weathering and biosequestration in shells. And so this, again, there are lots of different negative feedbacks we could add. You guys came up with a bunch of them there and that's great. This is the one that I came up with. As you get higher temperatures, so again, this global warming should probably be temperature. If I can, there, so maybe I'll cross that out and write temp. And so the idea here is if temperature rises, we get more weathering. So, you know, weathering is, is um, you know, that you get more wearing down of, um, so more chemical breaking down of things that wash away um, into the ocean. So with more temperature, you get more chemical activity, more weathering, which um, can end up leading to an increase in the biosequestration <clears throat> of carbon dioxide in shells. And so these, this faster rate of chemical processing allows for an increase in the rate of the production of shells, shells which pull carbon out of the air. And then as you get more sequestration of carbon in shells, kind of like the plant example, then you will eventually get uh, a decrease in temperature. But this is theoretically true, right? I mean, it will eventually happen, <clears throat> but building shelves is super, super slow compared to melting ice. And so the whole picture does include both of these. 
if we want to be honest about our models, we need to, whenever we think and from a systems perspective, <clears throat> it's sort of exciting to think about the kind of really negative consequences of positive feedback and vicious cycles. Uh, but we also really do need to consider, are there, there, nothing grows to the sky. There will always be limiting cases. And so we really, to be honest, need to include these negative uh, feedbacks as well, because maybe the negative feedbacks will be enough to counteract these. Or maybe at least we can imagine stakeholders asking a question before we invest in taking care of this problem, maybe the problem will take care of itself. So we need to show them that we've considered that. And then we go into the simulations in next unit and we simulate these things and we say, look, even when you consider all of these negative feedbacks, then we still end up having a problem, which means we need to intervene. Or we might not find that. We might find that once you do include all these negative feedbacks, the problem really does take care of itself in 10 years and we'll be fine. We just need to wait it out and that everything's take care of itself. It's probably not the case, but if we wanna be honest, when we build these models, we don't want garbage in, garbage out in terms of our assumptions. We have to include the entire system. And it just so happens that in the temperature system, the global warming system, most of the negative feedbacks are super slow compared to the positive feedback. So when you do simulate them out, there's usually not enough negative feedbacks in the short term and you get uh, something that feels like it's only positive. All right, so questions about this example. Okay. All right. So, um, but more generally, whenever we see a reinforcing loop next to a balancing loop, we're gradually going to become trained to start thinking about S-shaped growth. So reinforcing early, usually the reinforcing loop builds on a variable. And then we have a balancing loop that when that variable is large, the balancing force kicks in. So that's what I mean by reinforcing early, balancing late. And so that ends up leading to limits to growth or S-shaped growth here. So we just learn to kind of um, to, to look for these sorts of things. It is true that this will happen in the global temperature system, but the time at which it starts to round off might be very far in the future. And we have to ask, can we afford to wait for that? That's another sort of question that you would pose to a policymaker. All right, so that's kind of that example there. Using that as motivation, um, you know, it's this, there's this, or this little chapter that is online that you're reading for Thursday, and we're gonna see that there are a bunch of other different patterns. And once we learn to recognize some of these patterns, we can do two things with them. I kind of summarize this down here, and, uh, and we'll see, we'll see examples of this here in a second. If we see certain behaviors through time, then we can use the patterns that we're familiar with to help us build hypotheses for what the heck is going on under the surface. Or if we know what's going on under the surface, but we don't know what could happen over time, we can build these things. And if we recognize patterns we've seen before, we can say typically when we see these patterns, we get these shapes of things over time. And so that allows us to sort of predict what scenarios are possible given the things we know about what's going on under the surface kind of the two directions that we're looking for here. And so the, uh, our, our book, the Moorcroft book, focuses on a limited set of these uh, archetypes. The chapter you're reading for, um, for Thursday expands on these significantly. And <clears throat> but the point here is about the same, is that we learn that there are certain behaviors over time that are associated with certain archetypes. And so the kind of um, one of the simplest cases we've seen a lot of already is oscillations. And so you'd say there are a lot of systems that have oscillations that, that change, that can actually fluctuate. And we'd say, what, what normally leads to oscillations? And a common archetype is a balancing feedback loop with a delay. And so this is sort of a comfort seeking loop in the temperature control case for the water example here. And so we get these oscillations um, that have to do with um, trying to, it's kind of like running to catch your own tail. And so as you try to make a correction, then the, the actual uh, impact you feel is a delayed impact from a prior correction. You respond immediately thinking that that correction was not delayed. 
and you end up pushing things in the wrong direction because you're always sort of uh, two steps too uh, you know late and so um, you end up chasing yourself and that's what ends up creating these oscillations here now <clears throat> if you get rid of that delay then you get rid of the oscillations and so from this one archetype here balancing feedback with delay we learned that if you adjust the delay you can actually get things that look really oscillatory or things where the oscillations kind of go away and you very quickly actually catch your tail and so you actually get there and so the amount of delay is the quantitative thing just like in the previous example the relative difference between the fast loop and the slow loop determine whether we need to intervene on the fast loop here whether you have a, a very long delay between your shower and your water heater depend on whether you need a bigger water heater or move things forward or if it's a smaller delay then maybe you can leave the system alone so you know then we can say well we've also talked a lot about s-shaped growth and so um you know there are a bunch of examples with these s-shaped growth so these are kind of cartoon examples here eggs um chickens and road crossings so as you get more chickens you get more eggs uh, as you get more eggs you get more chickens so there's your growth root loop but then you say what limits the growth of the chicken population well <clears throat> lots of things but one factor in mortality is apparently road crossings so as chickens increase you get more road crossings as road crossings increase you ultimately get less chickens and i appreciate the last um so um so that ends up being one way to think about early in the chicken population demographics you get a whole bunch of growth in chickens until eventually there's so many chickens you can't avoid it there's crossing the roads and you end up rounding that off so s-shaped growth another kind of cartoon example here this is not a great cld this is a cld that was drawn in vinsim that i found online um but um but this is like the boy who cried wolf um so you've got um this growth loop here where you decide to cry wolf it brings townspeople and gives the boy attention um, attention is gained that relieves boredom decides he's going to try it all over again and so this is the growth of crying wolf but once you get so much crying wolf it becomes decoupled from something that's informational because they're always fake then we find that townspeople see no wolf so they reduce their estimate of the boy's credibility and they don't come running so um so this will end up reducing the creating a failure so you end up coming to a natural equilibrium where the boy is not spending all of the time crying wolf but spending 75 percent of his time crying wolf because if he goes any more than that nobody comes if he goes less than that he can end up going a little bit more than that and getting more enjoyment out of it of course we don't have the negative feedback loop here that actually involves the wolf you know and so you could say as fewer people come running there's higher risk to the boy of actually getting eaten by the wolf and then you could add all of that sort of thing in too but for now if we just focus on this thing this is sort of saying that there ends up being a balance between these two and that ends up kind of being the carrying capacity for crying wolf so common motif um, reinforcing loop followed by balancing loop can apply to a lot of things and we can combine those things together those two the reinforcing the balancing and the delay and uh, so now we're getting more complex. And so now we've got human population growth over here. We've got limiting, limited natural resources over here. But look, we added a delay in here. So why was that delay there? Well, we know that as humans are born, um, their use of natural resources immediately changes, relatively immediate. But um, as natural resources um, decrease, it has, it will eventually decrease the birth rate, but due to buffers in the system, it will take a lot longer. And so it's kind of like um, the amount of fish, you know, as you're fishing that fishery, even though the fish are being depleted, you don't actually see a depletion in catch rate until it's kind of too late. And there's sort of a similar thing being captured by the delay here. So there are questions in the muddiest points and things like that about when do you include delays and when do you not? And kind of the point here is that the birth rate, the natural resources causal link here is relatively instantaneous. Um, we can kind of assume that immediately those new offspring start using up resources, but the, on the other side of it, the depletion effect from depleting natural resources doesn't immediately deplete the birth rate. And that is, it's about relative difference here. And so 
This is much slower than this bottom one, which is why they put the delay there. What that means is that you combine these things together and you still get a reinforcing loop that grows and starts to limit itself, but those limitations lead up having these oscillations, again, because of these buffers in the system, because you can grow way beyond the natural resources allow you to grow, leads to a, an eventual crash in birth rate, but then that crash in birth rate gives you a little bit of headroom because you now can use, you now have less than your carrying capacity and so you can climb back up again. So you get this oscillation of growth with overshoot. And we've seen examples of this. If we were to go in to look at Forrester's model for um, the world dynamics for limits to growth, then effectively when he tweaks a parameter, it's doing the same thing as making this delay larger and larger. So as you tweak that parameter, you can get large collapses, which are kind of like if that delay is really large, you get huge corrections. If that delay is small, so you have very fast feedback from natural resources to birth rate, then things can level off without the oscillations. So we now in this model have the capability to have much richer behavior that is parameterized by the actual delay that we put in. So we're making these more and more complex to allow us to play with more hypotheses, like this hypothetical delay here, how does it affect things? So we might count on S-shaped growth without delay where things nicely settle off. But now we can say, but what if there's a delay? How much does it change things? And it turns out if there's a significant delay, we get a qualitatively different approach or qualitatively different behavior over time where we can actually get massive collapses because we can overuse our resources before we even realize that we've overused our resources. So it's kind of you know where we go with that. So this is kind of what we're building up to. And as you start reading the chapter for Thursday, you're gonna see that we can get these loops far more complex than this and have really interesting characteristics in their behavior over time. And without this kind of insight into the latent behavior or the latent variables underlying these systems, these weird behaviors that we get out of these behaviors over time, we might just assume are totally random. But what this perspective gives us is an alternative approach. We could say, these could be random, but maybe actually the behaviors you're seeing are totally predictable consequences of, of adding enough complexity into your models. And that's what we're trying to do here and in the next unit is to add that realistic complexity. All right, so any questions about these examples? How we go from simple to more complex. All right, so while you're thinking about, it, let me do an attendance exercise, mid-class attendance exercise. I'll also put the link in the chat. And the question uh, I guess we'll do here is, <clears throat> what, um, I'll call it, what archetype is generally associated with oscillation. So saying that if we just have oscillation, we're not worried about growth, we just see a bunch of oscillations, then what typically might we expect as a hypothetical causal archetype that would give us oscillations? So, you know, like, is it, um, is it a balancing loop with delay? Is it, a reinforcing loop with um, a, a balancing loop. So is it is it limits to success or S-shaped growth? Is it, you know, so what what are the things, however you'd like to capture that, you can put that in in uh, in your response. Okay. All right, so so that's the basic motivation. So how do we do this in practice? Uh, and this is sort of introducing us to again, what we're gonna be reading for Thursday. And so the idea here um, that some people propose is sort of a decision tree where you can kind of build up complex diagrams from simple diagrams based on the phenomena that you're seeing. And so in this approach here, um, this is taken from this kind of systems thinker resource, which is also where that article for Thursday comes from. So as an example, in this sort of decision tree from uh, systems thinker, they say, well, let's say I'm concerned about growth. And so, um, so up here we can say, I'm, I'm concerned about growth. Well, if I'm concerned about growth, 
I know I need to start with a reinforcing loop. So if I've modeled something that grows, that increases over time, there's got to be a reinforcing loop in there somewhere. So I'm going to start. What's the reinforcing loop? And so now I can ask myself, what's growing? Well, the thing that's growing, that's one variable in the reinforcing loop. What's causing it to grow? That's the other variable in the reinforcing loop. So I'm going to write those two things down. I'm going to connect them with links, confirm that they're positive links, and I've got my reinforcing loop. OK, that's fine. But, but nothing grows forever. That's what it says down here on the side. So that means that <clears throat> I'm modeling my growth, but this growth can't go on forever. Something's going to limit it. So I really need to add a balancing loop next to that reinforcing loop. So then I say, where is the balancing come from? Just like we started out with, we had the growth in temperature, but then we also had the theoretical limitation loop on the other side. So I say, what are things that could limit the growth? Well, I need to put that in there. So find a variable that plausibly could limit the growth. And that's my balancing loop. So I put that over there. Okay, okay, that's fine. Now I can say, recognizing that I have um, a limitation, if I'm doing um, an intervention here where I want to make sure I increase my, or keep my growth growing as much as possible. So let's say I want growth. So it's not like global warming here. I want to increase my market share or I increase adoption of recycling or something like that or wearing a mask or whatever you might be. If I want to increase that as long as possible, then I probably need a mechanism that limits the limitation. So, um, <clears throat> I might have an investment loop where I can keep reinvesting in more capacity so that I don't ultimately have a limited capacity. But that investment loop is going to have a target capacity. And so that might indicate that my advancer would advance. All right, so all right, this is me going down this side. So we've got the growing action growing action, I have to add my limitation. But then down here, if I've got my growing action, and I know that I'm ultimately um, limited <clears throat> by my performance capacity, if again, imagine this is like trying to measure market share. So I want to grow my market share, but my market share is ultimately going to be limited by how well my, my team can perform. So they've got a certain capacity. So I might need to invest in more people on my team to maintain the growth. And so I'm gonna have a performance standard that I want to um, hit, and that is gonna drive my investment decisions. So, um, so this is a kind of a natural process there. Well, what's the potential problems that could happen? Well, I might've set my performance standard too low. And if I set my performance standard too low, then this capacity regulation loop is like doubly bad <clears throat> because it's gonna start working against me because if, um, if it turns out that the capacity I thought I needed is lower than the capacity I actually needed, then I'm going to effectively divest in my capacity and bring my system to this lower performance standard. So it just goes to show that by setting performance standards, I have to be really careful about that I didn't set the performance standard too high or too low. It's kind of like if we were to apply this to say, um, markets for carbon dioxide or something like that. So um, cap and trade. If you, you have to be really careful where you set the caps. And so your performance standard can affect whether the whole system works or the whole system kind of ignores the cap and trade entirely. So it's kind of like this process shows me that in order to maintain growth, the key problem is really setting the performance standards properly. Now, I might be modeling something else in my strategic. So I might be saying, I'm actually worried not about growth, but fixing a problem. Well, if you want to fix a problem, your mind, the first thing it should go to is a balancing loop. And that balancing loop is going to have the problem as one of its variables and the action to fix that problem as another variable. So, you know, you build the balancing loop first. But then you can say, <clears throat> well, what are potential problems? that I could have with my solution. And so um, one of those problems is that the fix might come back to haunt me. And this is a motif that the article that we read for Thursday calls fixes that fail. And so that motif is going to be, there's going to be a reinforcing loop that actually ends up reducing the, the efficacy or actually increasing the problem. So the, the solution ends up both 
reducing the problem in the short run and increasing the problem in the long run. So in their example here, if you've got a cash flow problem, an easy solution is to borrow cash. That will, on the short term, solve your cash flow problem. But by borrowing cash, even though on the short term, you get more cash out, in the long term, you're going to be paying interest on the cash you borrowed, which is going to reduce your cash flow in the long term more. So in fixes that fail, you've chosen a fix that has <clears throat> these side effects that actually end up being in the wrong direction. So when you're building these fix loops, you have to ask yourself, did I create a fix that when I think from the systemic view is actually um, going to create more of a problem in the long run? Now, <clears throat> so then you think, well, all right, so if I did implement that fix, uh, then um, what, what should I have done? And what will my fix do with respect to what should I have done? And so um, the real thing I should have done was implement financial controls. So when I have a cash flow problem, I could borrow in the short term, but ideally I would say, well, I'm going to budget and maybe not spend as much on certain things. And so that will be my financial controls. And that will ultimately fix my cash flow problem without um, as many side effects. Now the side effect could be, I don't get to watch Netflix as much, or I can't pay for my health care, or these sorts of things. So there's a lot of other side effects that be added in here. Um, so, but let's imagine that financial controls is a responsible thing to do with minimal side effects. That's what you really wanted to do. Now we could say, well, but I end up doing the borrowing thing. Well, by borrowing, not only does it create a, a larger cash flow problem later, but borrowing also, makes it even harder for me to do financial controls because now I think that whenever I have a problem, I just borrow. So there's even less pressure for me to budget. So borrowers typically don't do a lot of budgeting because they borrow instead of budgeting. And so, so fixes that fail highlights how a solution can simultaneously be a problem. When we add the additional loop here, then that's the so-called shifting the burden uh, archetype, which shows us that not only can solutions be problems, but solutions can prevent other solutions that are better from actually acting. And that's kind of the lesson here. So as we're building up, you know, so the, the, this process here, when you're thinking about fixing a problem, what they're trying to say here is that before you stop in this process, you want to kind of examine um, have I created a fix? Have I picked a fix that fails? And um, what would be a better fix? And is there a conflict between these two fixes that where if I were to implement this fix, I'll probably never be able to get this fix to happen because this fix will reduce um, the likelihood that this fix will even start. And so by this having this full kind of process here, it kind of tells the implementer that maybe I should have just started with the fundamental fix. And that would be a much simpler system. It might be a little harder to implement, but it's more sustainable. So that's kind of the process here where we're trying to use these kind of decision trees that show how you can build from one simple archetype into these other archetypes to guide our decision-making about the right solutions to choose. And that's all I'm kind of saying there. <clears throat> and so this little decision tree, which is included in the, uh, the article you're going to read for Thursday, you can actually find all of the archetypes that Moorcroft has included in this map. And so, um, so these are really standard ones. And this is kind of um, an expansion of those, which includes even more from that. By the end of the class, uh, end of the semester, I'm not expecting you to memorize all of these archetypes. But I want you to be sort of be familiar that this, you know, cat or this dictionary of archetypes exists, so that when um, so you just become you sort of know how to use it. And so I might give you this decision tree on an exam as an auxiliary piece of help or whatever, and then ask you their questions about it or allow you to use it. Where I could say, hypothetically speaking, let's say you did, uh, you know, you had problem A, you want to do problem B. Um, what are some archetypes that might um, uh, you know, lead, lead you to um, question whether this is a good solution or something like that. And so then you'd have these and you could say, well, since I'm solving a problem, then um, what does that end up, you know, what does that lead to? So accidental adversaries, 
That's one we've talked about before. So some that we've already talked about have already been in here. Escalation is already in here. So it's kind of an intro to the thing that we will read for Thursday. So any questions about those two examples, the, the investment example and um, the uh, growth example, the growth investment example. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so what we're gonna do for the rest of uh, the time here is, um, so I'm gonna start, there is a, a uh, homework assignment uh, formally announced today um, that, uh, but has been available on there. And it's due, um, so this simple assignment, it's just two questions. And so um, it's, I've got it due uh, on Thursday, um, but I think initially due to changes in schedule, uh, when I originally planned this thing out, when I, I think I used to put a weekend here. So I might end up extending the due date on this, but it's, it's really a simple uh, assignment. Um, but uh, but I think I'm leaning towards extending this, giving you maybe a week instead of a couple of days. Uh, but we're going to start it in class, so you, you probably be able to get a lot of momentum done. But I'm also worried about the hybrid thing um, affecting our uh, how well we'll get far on this. Otherwise, got the reading assignments due on Thursday. A lot of you've already done that. Great comments on perusal. Thanks for all of that. Um, and then um, and then looking into Sunday, um, we've got the Muddy's Point assignment. Um, and then today's assignment, yeah, okay. So this up here, it's a night before. Yeah, this, I think I just, this is what I meant. I wanted it to be due uh, on Sunday. This is a mistake up here where it says night before C2 next lecture. So today's assignment is meant to do this upcoming Sunday. And I'll show you what that assignment is. So in this assignment, um, basically we're gonna have, you know, with, a group both in the class and I'm also gonna form breakout rooms online, um, then we're going to have you build an S-shaped growth loop. So we're gonna do it in two parts. And so um, I've got this organized with um, Google um, uh, slides so that um, each one can draw on a different slide and you're gonna draw a very simple S-shaped growth um, uh, curve. So you know maybe three variables, four variables, a couple of links. Um, you're going to just draw it without labeling the links, and then we're going to have another group label your links for you, and then we'll, and we'll see what everybody comes up with. Then for the second activity, you do the same thing, but with a little bit more complicated uh, archetype called drifting goals. And this is uh, echoed on the sheets that I have online. And so again, we'll do have one group start, uh, the, do the variables, swap with another group, label the links, and then we'll see what everybody comes up with. And those two things, you can use whatever you come up with in class on the, uh, the diagram that you submit as part of the assignment. And so, um, and so it's fine if people have, uh, you know, that overlaps because you're gonna be working together on this anyway in groups of say two or three. So that's basically what we're um, doing. So we're gonna work in these small groups. And um, I want, again, so your, the eventual submissions to show your individual effort. So, you know, if you're submitting them in VinSim, it'd be great if everybody draws their own, but I'm okay if the systems you draw, like use the same variables. And so I want you to show that you, you know, use this as an opportunity, an individual opportunity to practice your drawing in VinSim, um, but, um, but the actual systems can match others. So that's basically what we're gonna do here. And then I'll maybe throw up an, an a, a attendance assignment toward the end here. So right now, um, if, Everybody in class and online, if you go to this link in the upper corner here, it should open a Google Slides page. And if you'd prefer those in class, I'm also happy with you using paper if that's easier, um, but it's just nice to use the slides so that uh, it, it just, it's easier for everyone to see and everyone to share and then review afterwards as well. Um, so if you go to that, um, there should be the first like 10 slides, we'll say group like one through 10 in person or A through H or something in person. And then the next 10 slides will say group one through 10 Zoom. So um, we'll have you break up with, uh, you know, you can maybe a couple of people around you. And, um, and I guess I'll just, I'll go around, I'll say like, like group one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So just like if you're on the 
if you're on this side of the class, your odd numbers. If you're on this side of the class, your even numbers. Then we can claim a page. And then online, I'll put you into breakout rooms, and that'll be the numbers, the um, the numbers associated with it. So let's give this a shot. I've never done this hybrid. I'm a little scared to death about it, um, but uh, we'll 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 make it work. I'll part I'll jump around to breakout rooms online. Maybe Eric can also jump around to breakout rooms online, and then also sort of monitor things in class. So online, I'm going to put you into uh, breakout rooms. And you can kind of self-assign, um, it, but it's, yeah, so right, self-assign, and then we'll figure out the numbering after you do that, or the lettering after that. Automatically. All right, online, I'm just randomly assigning you. All right, online, it's uh, I'm going to just manually move everyone. It's not randomly assigning you the way it's supposed to. So, just a second. We'll call you guys group A. We'll call you guys group B. We'll call you guys group C. C. Okay. Group D. Cool. Up up. Um, are there two groups or, or one group? One big, all right, we'll call you group E. Oh, well, I, I gave C, can you, if you. We've already learned our names, but I can just copy them. Yeah, if you can just copy and paste them. E, and then maybe group F, is that okay? okay. Yes. Oh yeah, I, sorry, I forgot you were. Yeah. <laughs> 